Lita Khan appeared on The Daily Show. Standing ovation. Okay, the crowd is like going wild. Like I did not realize until this interview that she genuinely believed her job was to make sure that these companies actually failed. The proposed law will legally establish a right to disconnect. Just turn the phone off, dude. All the normies that I know that work email jobs, none of them work hard at all. And she's like, why do these folks want kids learning math so fast? Uh, and then she <laughs> screenshots something. If you're advocating for equity in education, you're always going to be advocating for gifted kids to not perform in gifted ways. The squatters are taking over. By the way, I've got Venezuelan migrants who got released from an ICE processing center. These are the whitest Venezuelans I've ever seen in my life. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the pod. Uh, right at the top, I want to start with Lena Khan. This is a couple days old. Uh, Lena Khan appeared on The Daily Show. She kind of, this is a Biden's FTC chairwoman, his kind of like industry terrorist in chief. Her job is to dismantle big tech, roughly. I mean, that's sort of her self proclaimed job, I guess, at this point. This is the mandate that she believes that she has. Uh, and she's been executing, you know, with great force. Uh, she calls herself sort of entrepreneurial about it. She appears at The Daily Show. It's a big to do. Mostly the, the headline there was, um, John had wanted to do this at Apple and was not allowed for whatever reason. I got to tell you, I wanted to have you on a podcast and Apple asked us not to do it, to have you. They, they literally said, please don't talk to her. I sat down to watch it just because I'd heard so much about it. And what I found was much funnier than that. Um, so first of all, she, she shows up. This is a government official, right? <clears throat> her job is to just sort of go after companies. I didn't even think that anybody knew who she was outside of tech. Standing ovation. Okay, the crowd is like going wild over Lena Khan, who's not even said anything at this point. Um, she sits down. At this point now, the crowd, every time she sort of insinuates, this is a 20 minute sort of mutual masturbatory interview between her and Stuart, just like loving each other, obsessed with each other. Uh, every time she even sort of casually implies that she's going to sort of go after this or that tech company, wild cheers from the audience. And about like five minutes in, I realized this sort of strange absence of any actual claim that any tech company had done anything wrong whatsoever. I sort of kept waiting for that to happen. And, and it, it never, it never appeared once. Um, and I, I want to get your thoughts on all this, but I, I want to kind of go through a few sort of interesting pieces of the interview first, and then just kind of get your take on her specifically and this kind of cultural moment that we're in more generally. Uh, at one point in their sort of lambasting of tech, Stuart, pretty sure sort of argued, not argued, suggested that Jeff Bezos was still running Amazon. Uh, there was at one point a conflation of Boeing. So uh, Lena Khan mentions if they don't get sort of big tech under control, you know, Boeing jets are going to keep falling out of the sky. So this bizarre conflation of that airline with, I don't know, Apple's potential monopoly on the App Store. Um, the most interesting and telling piece to me, I think, and the real substance of it, probably for this conversation, uh, she spoke about Instagram specifically, the Instagram acquisition. Now, when Facebook acquired Instagram, it was like 10 years ago, it was universally made fun of throughout not only, you know, the press, but tech. Everyone was like, this is crazy, a billion dollars for what? It made no sense. Facebook mm. buying the free smartphone mobile sharing app for a billion dollars. A billion dollars of money? <laughs> for a thing that kind of ruins your pictures? Now, obviously, it's seen as like the most genius move ever in the history of social media. Lena says her, her breakdown for this is like, at the time that Facebook acquired Instagram, they needed to acquire Instagram because Facebook sucked for mobile and Instagram was great at it. And if Facebook did not acquire Instagram, that company, she believes, would have failed, which I didn't realize like, I did not realize until this interview that she genuinely believed her job was to make sure that these companies actually failed. Like, wh what is it about, it, it, if you just break that position down, what she's saying is like, success itself is anti-competitive. Anyway, crazy interview. Um, really, what you see there is a desire on her part to take apart business. 
um, there's not really an actual claim that she's made uh, against any of these companies that she went after and the crowd loved it. So she certainly, her and John both, and we said earlier, maybe a few weeks back, maybe a couple months back, we talked about Stewart being a new force in media. He, he certainly is. The clips are huge. The show is huge. His audience loves it. Um, what do you make of the Lena Khan moment? I mean, it's pretty clear that there's a tech backlash. I feel like it's surprising and a little bit dismaying to see a standing ovation for very, so like the, the message of Lena Khan is essentially tech's bad and people are like, you know, chimping out <laughs> over that, which Dude, is and she's in a, strange. A, a government, a government official too. The, the, the whole framing that Stewart kept hammering home with her. She, she gave it to herself. She, she invoked the language of like scrappy upstart and whatnot. They're trying to frame an official for the most powerful government in human history as an underdog in a fight against, in a fight against big tech. That's crazy to me. Like who actually holds power in this country? The t tech companies hold a lot of power and a lot of wealth, but the government is power. They're literally power. What is she talking about? I don't understand this. You're not an underdog. And Stewart kind of, I mean, he is just, he's like a clown for the Democrats. I understand that. It's embarrassing. I don't know why, I don't know. I don't know why he thinks that he's fighting for, for the little guy there. I mean, she's the biggest guy you could possibly be. Yeah, I, I don't really get how antitrust is supposed to work in the tech space. This is something that's bothered me for a long time because I'm generally somebody who I support antitrust. You know, uh, I think there is a lot of industries, uh, especially in agriculture and some other places where it's, it's just gotten way too big and it is uncompetitive. And um, same thing goes with the medical sector. And there's a lot of companies where you could break them up because they make a product uh, and they have basically they've cornered a market and nobody else can enter in it. Uh, because it would be competitive and it's things like insulin or um, seeds like Monsanto branded uh, sorry uh, patented seeds uh, things like that but when it comes to tech the reason that these are monopolies is because of consumer choice you know when you go to the grocery store and you buy tomato you don't know it's a Monsanto tomato you just buy the tomato um and the, the competition is all around price. And if you are big enough, you can corner the market and uh, essentially make things uncompetitive. With with tech, though, I, I think it's a lot different, especially when you're talking about social media, because people are choosing these companies because they offer a product. And in order for a social media company to work, you have to have scale. People are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or whatever, because other people are on it. Uh, so you can't break it up and have two different Twitters with, you know, half of the consumers go to one, half to go to the other. It would basically just you would create two companies where one would succeed and one would fail, and then you would have a monopoly all over again. So the the whole concept of uh, antitrust when it comes to social media specifically has never really made sense to me at all. The... Um I noticed this a handful of years ago. They started to, and I think it's a great question. What, you know, what do they actually mean when they're talking about antitrust here? I think forever the idea was: is there consumer harm? You know, is this company cornering a market on some vital thing that you need? I think probably famously the railroads, right? Like you, you need access to the railroads, and if you don't have it, you're screwed. And if someone has cornered the entire market and they can jack up the prices, there's clear consumer harm there. Um, they really have distanced themselves from that question of consumer harm. Uh, and you could say, I think you can make an argument, sort of, certainly Jonathan hates doing it, um, that social media is harming people, harming kids specifically. I think the evidence there is pretty mixed. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit. We sort of all kind of roughly intuitively feel that it's bad, but there's not, I don't think there's real evidence there, but it's sort of a separate question f when it comes to antitrust. If you think it's really bad, like it's cigarettes or something, that's not an antitrust question. That's like an FDA question or something. Um, they're, they're now for, for the monopoly conversations, for the antitrust conversations, they are really sort of totally discarding the question of whether or not this person having dominance is bad. And in fact, there are these places where dominance is really good, including in the marketplace. Talk about Amazon, like Amazon at scale is able to do delivery the way that it is for so inexpensively. And that's actually really good for consumers. The prices historically have been really good. You could break that apart and, and sort of find some nefarious thing that they're doing. I'm sure there's something that someone in the comments will leave us. Uh, but in general, like cheap shit, people tend 
to enjoy. And um, that's what Amazon has been able to afford. They don't really care. And so you have to sort of ask yourself like, what is the real reason for this? And I think it's linked to the people cheering and you know the standing ovation and whatnot. It does just seem like they're very rich and they're very successful and in a manner that has not really been seen in, you know, a long, long, maybe ever sort of time, this many people or this few people with so much wealth, right? Like that that's the thing itself that is bothering them. It's not that th the success is hurting anybody else. It's that the success is itself sort of unprecedented. Um, and it just drives people like this crazy. Yeah. I mean, the, the nefarious things that companies like Amazon are doing do not actually affect the average person. In fact, they actually help the consumer in some ways, which is why uh, antitrust has been slow because it's just doctrine that if the consumer is getting a you know something for a cheaper price or whatever, you can't really intervene. But the stuff that they're doing is like uh, hurting other small businesses essentially. Like I've heard stories about people like they'll make a product, they start selling it on Amazon, it does really well, and then Amazon basically copies their product and sells it at a cheaper price. Um, and so stuff like that, um, I, you know, I think is genuinely. Uh, that is anti-competitive and that is a problem, but wait, that's wait, wait. not why these people are cheering in my opinion. But let's talk, I want to talk about this question that you just raised, anti-competitive. You know, you said it is anti-competitive and that's why it's a problem. I, I don't know that, first of all, I don't know that it's anti-competitive, it's competitive and they're, they're winning the competition. But I would say, why does it, why, why is competition itself the thing that we are prizing here? Why are we saying they, they need to not be winning this competition? It, it's like, do you care about consumers or do you care about sort of this strange like ideal of of uh, of lots of people competing? I don't really know why we care about that, the competition piece. Why does it matter? Historically, I think you, you could make the argument that you, you needed to care about that because that and consumer harm were linked. But if it's not the case, then which thing should you care about? And it's like, clearly you should care about the consumers. There's a more, there's maybe a more salient anecdote here, which is the Department of Justice's lawsuit against Apple. One of the things they're a, a, quote unquote accusing Apple of is not allowing other smartwatches to pair with the iPhone. And it's like, what that, that it's totally incoherent along the lines of competition because this is just a product that they offer that yeah. the consumer can either opt into or opt out of. And um, I don't see how. It, I don't see how any competition concerns come in there at all because it's it's basically a one product, the the iPhone and the Apple Watch pair, and that's super confusing. It's like if Sega Genesis back in the day got really really huge, and then they were sued because they wouldn't allow you to play Nintendo games on the Sega or something. Right. Like, wait, did I that actually happen, or is that a? Or no, you... it's not, that's to the best of my knowledge, that's never happened. But okay, it, but like, if <laughs> yeah, it's it, like that's that. what yeah. it sort of that's right. what it is. That's what's happening exactly. here. The phone they think is just too big, and so you have to be allowed for for, in, for the App Store one. It's like you have to be allowed onto the App Store to to compete. But then when again when when we get to the point where it's like, well, how is this harming consumers? It's always some really abstract idealistic argument about like, well, just imagine all of the flourishing of interesting ideas we would have if it were more open. And I actually think that that's true. And I fucking hate how closed off Apple is, but it's, it's not really clear that it's worse for the consumer. In fact, I think you can make an argument that it's much better for the consumer. Um, Apple famous, I mean, when we, Apple first took off, it was the era of the, people were getting viruses on their computers still. Like, I mean, your computer would be crippled with yeah. viruses. And Apple took off because it was a closed system that was better at policing that. I, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. Part of it was a brand monopoly, just like it looked better. That those cool iPod commercials that everyone, well, they were cool then, everyone loved them. I mean, who knows, but the closed, element of that system was seen as advantageous for certain things that were seen as to the consumer's benefit. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like the broader question that's been happening for antitrust is a, for a long time, which is, does the, is the consumer the only person that matters in the equation or is there a broader project of competition that we need to be pursuing on the market? Like, is it, are we may, is it, becoming too difficult for smaller firms to compete and you know what effects does that have on innovation on the broader economy blah 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 there's like a whole body of literature about this but 
I mean, I, you can make the argument either way. I mean, I do think there are downsides to something like Apple, where like if you get, you know, if you get an iPhone, you are kind of like locked into the system where you have to keep buying like more no, Apple. You just products. get a different phone. You're not locked into any system at all. You can just you can just not use an app. You can just not use an iPhone. And when it comes to the the sort of argument about you know, these companies are, you can't compete with them anymore and whatnot. There wasn't a version of Amazon before Amazon. And there wasn't a version of Facebook before Facebook. Like all of these companies are, so there's, there wasn't a version of Uber before Uber. They're all sort of first of their kind. I mean, yes, it's true. I think competing with them at this point is very, very hard. I don't know entirely how you would do it. You think about Google and this, and the, Google has a search monopoly and has forever. Um, it hasn't hurt consumers. It seems totally fine for consumers. And it's weird to sort of invent something that never before existed. That was the Google specifically. It was their it was their algorithm or not their algorithm. It would have been it was their specific search. Uh, I forget what it was exactly. It was like they their their technology the techno the underlying technology behind their search was very different than what had come previously. It was very simple and it was very effective, and they won. But it wasn't like it didn't exist before that. So it's just weird to say like, you're too big to compete with if what you're competing with is something that is brand new. It would be like if this podcast got huge and like, I mean, millions of people are watching it and people are saying like, well, it's not fair to other people who want to start a Pirate Wires podcast. <laughs> it's like, okay, sorry. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just like making like the- Yeah, yeah, sorry. We'll keep making presenting it. Because I'm confused. That, I want to, that, I want to understand there. what the hell is going on with this. It's crazy. And actually, River, what do you make um, as a sort of like a, I would say like a, like a, like a Glenn Greenwaldian leftist um, no. with a, a healthy suspicion of government. What do you make of like the Stuart sort of sitting down with the government official thing and, and just, you know, celebrating her publicly as a left-wing guy? I mean, it's strange, no? Yeah, it is. And it, it reminds me of, if you remember a couple of years ago when libs were buying stamps because of something that the postmaster general did with mail-in ballots or something, it was like three layers of convoluted political nonsense. Um, but like the post office website sold out of stamps. It was like a weird thing, but it like it's this rise of political hobbyists, uh, hobbyism where you have not only does John Stewart know who this woman is, but his audience knows who this woman is, and it's a, it's a, it, in a way, it's like a subcultural thing. I actually don't think that it even describes like the average Democratic voter or anything. It, it's really odd. Uh, Sajana, last thoughts before we move on to another banger, if I do say so myself. River, to your point about how consumers are driving tech monopolies uh, in a lot of ways, in ways that they they weren't necessarily driving agricultural monopolies or rail monopolies. I mean, I think my sense on this whole tech antitrust debate is like if consumers want to proactively opt out of things like Amazon and spend more money to support small businesses because they sort of think that, you know, the monopoly of Amazon or, you know, an Apple monopoly over phones is bad and they want to spend more money to buy other goods is almost like a political statement. That seems like the way to sort of fight uh, the, the tech monopoly if you think it's bad. I don't think someone like Lena Khan coming in uh, and, you know, implementing some top-down government solution that probably is going to have just the effect of, you know, eventually recreating the monopoly in a different way because people are always going to opt into the best technology. They're always going to choose Google PageRank over, you know, whatever other search competitor came before it. Um, that seems like the solution to me. Cause I, I do feel, I understand people who are sort of frustrated by, you know, Amazon's practices around copying other consumer goods or just like, don't want to live in a world where you're ordering your toothpaste to be delivered by prime or something like that. But if you don't want to live in a world like that, you should just go out and buy your own <laughs> toothpaste at the store instead of ordering it to your house. Like a lot of this just seems like, consumers are choosing convenience uh, and, you know, you get the world that you pay for, basically. Right. And I guess there there, there is a, a degree of like, the more people do it, the more you sort of have to do it yourself. You know, you, the, the world opts you into the system at a certain point. 
But I don't know. I, I don't really hear people talking about it this way. I don't hear people talking about the sort of remote culture and how sort of spiritually harming that maybe is. And I don't see people talking about like in the context of the FTC, they're not talking about social media sort of depressing us and our kids. It's it's just a straight economic argument that doesn't make any sense. And it betrays, I think, the real motivation behind all of this, which is just to punish people who are successful in tech specifically, which increasingly I do believe is seen as a fount of by the by Washington people, I think it is seen as a fount of competitive power, which is alarming. And you see these people kind of emerging from Washington, wanting to be involved in tech. There are no shortage of people from, you know, whatever administration immediately making a beeline into either a VC shop or working in-house at some giant tech company, or in the case of what's his face, I forget his name now, the guy who worked for Trump, who now thinks he's going to buy TikTok, right? Like they're all fantasizing about being Mark Zuckerberg. It's this weird mimetic hellscape. Um, and, and I think that's what's, that's what is happening. It's like, it is just a war for power. Uh, it has nothing to do with any of us. Um, speaking of disconnection though, thank God for Matt Haney in San Francisco, who went from being just one of the worst supervisors in history to one of the worst state assemblymen in California state history. Uh, that is sort of what happens, I think, in the state. And Sanjana, you can really break that down for us later. But it, it, it seems like people just sort of fail up for out, throughout their entire careers. Uh, this dude drops a bill and it is going to be, you know, people have the, the, the actual right, he argues, to disconnect from their phone. And what he means by that is uh, a limited number of hours through which you can be reached by email. It will be after which, after the set number of hours, it will be literally illegal. I think, Brandon, I, th I believe you're the one that researched this one. It'd be literally illegal to send an email. I don't know. Unpack it for me. The proposed law will legally establish a right to disconnect. And basically it will require every employer in California to have a policy or action plan communicating how it will implement that standard. That's from a news article that I read about it. So it's not totally 100% clear. Um, enforcement of the law will be done via the Department of Labor, which could levy fines at $100 per incident for employers with a, a who, like, I don't know, paying somebody at 5.01 p.m. or something like that. It's, a, it's totally, in my opinion, the weirdest law that I've ever come across, quite frankly, because for me, it doesn't make... <laughs> It doesn't make any sense whatsoever because peeps, people self-select into jobs that are difficult and they self-select out of jobs that are difficult at the same time. If this if this bill is directed at the laptop class, um, the laptop class that doesn't want to work very hard and wants to just like clock in at nine and leave at five, they're already in jobs like that. So I'm not sure what this, like, and the people that want to work hard are like going after ambitious aspirational positions in ambitious companies and working hard because they choose to do that. So it's totally weird that like California is just like, no, I don't consent, you know, when everybody else is consenting. Um, so yeah, I <laughs> no, think it's, it's like a that, really weird. It's, it's that meme. It's like that meme. Yeah. It's totally <laughs> that meme. It's like, not me, you know? And um, I don't, I don't get it. It's creepy to me. Like why, why, why does California it's almost like they they assume that there's a quote in the in the standard by Haney. They they got him to to talk about the bill. He says right now it's it's very murky, and he's talking about jobs. I guess like it's very murky, and people on the left, people are left expecting to be working and responsive all the time. And so that's his quote. He's like, people don't know what to expect at their jobs, and. So Haney actually thinks that there are like hundreds of thousands of Californians, again, in the laptop class who don't know what their job expectations are. It doesn't like, for, for me, this is like not actually realistic and not happening. I think I, uh, there is an interesting thing here, at least. I, I think that Haney is correct to address new behaviors in a world where we fundamentally change because of technology, right? The, the phone has changed behavior. I think people are way more connected now than they ever were. I think it has a lot of, I think it has a lot of negative effect on our lives too. I, I sort of agree with all of these different things. Um, I think it's worth talking about. I think it's a crazy thing to pass a law on. It's specifically crazy because 
one, I don't know what kind of law you would pass to, to really fix this problem of a fundamental shift in society because of a technology that's changed the way that we communicate. But what he sort of does is he erases the possibility for opting into a situation where really you work at a startup, for example. There's there's no such thing as a startup that can just clock out after, you know, b- after the hours of five or before the hours of nine. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. Like there's work all of the time. There are lots of jobs even outside of startups that are like this. Uh, you're working in a newsroom and you're chasing a story. They don't just stop in the middle of a story because, well, I've like reached my average hours per week. You're on salary. You're not getting paid by the hour. And if you want to get paid by the hour, you can do that. There are jobs where you can do that. Um, I think it is a complicated labor issue, but I, and I would be more willing to sort of even entertain it if it wasn't framed in such a way as was like, I personally would not even be permitted to opt into a situation like this. You see this huge push also on the left to, and again, when I say left, it's, I'm talking far left, like Rose in bio left, hammer and sickle in bio left, leftists, like crazy deranged Twitter left. Uh, you see a, a push to ban like what they call child labor, which is 14 year olds working at McDonald's or something. Um, a- anyone who is a teenager getting a job, which I is another situation where I think to myself, it's not your right to tell me what I can and cannot do. My job when I was 13 working illegally uh, and then 14 when I started working legally on the, on the boardwalk, it changed my life for the better. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I worked all the time. I absolutely loved it. I made new friends. I I had my own money. I had freedom. Um, and it was all sort of with a kind of training wheel situation. And I get that these, the, you know, high level, the reason we even have child labor laws is because you have these situations of exploitation or whatever. Um, you had kids, you know, forced in factories and whatnot by their family. Okay, that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is you are telling me a adult perfectly capable of making his own decisions on the way that he wants to live, how to live. And it annoys me. It really does. No, it's more than it infuriates me, I would say. I'm infuriated. River. It, it's a professional class politics uh, is essentially what it is. It is there, there's been this weird move on the left. And I wrote about this a lot early in my career, how the modern left is essentially just a form of upper middle class politics um, or PMC politics, class politics, whatever you want to call it. And th- that's basically what this is, because if you are a working class person, you are not going to be getting Slack messages at all. And you're definitely not going to be getting them in the middle of the night. And I do sometimes, and that's fine because I signed up for this and I get a nice salary and whatever. Um, I-, I think... Um, I think it's kind of ridiculous uh, to to go after that. I mean, they're clearly playing to their, the left is clearly playing to its base, which is no longer working class people. It is people who have email jobs. And I mean, that in and of itself is one of the craziest political developments, I think, um, of of the 21st century is that the people, is that this great divide between the left and the working class, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I find it fascinating for that reason. But I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I don't like, you know, sometimes it is kind of hard to find a work life balance. Um, if you work remotely, if you have a job where you're like, you know, journalism where you're kind of on the clock all the time, but it's what you signed up for. And um, if you can't handle it, then, you know, you have to get another job. I don't know what I sort of thought that you would have, uh, out of everyone here, been the most kind of interested, at least in the question, or, or like you're clearly interested, but like op- open to it for some reason. Do you not kind of could you could you maybe steal me where they're coming from? Yeah, I mean where they're coming from is they want a they want to create more work life balance um, for people they don't have. They view it as a labor issue where you know productivity has risen, yet a lot of people in these sort of email job positions feel like they're still on the clock all the time. It creates these neuroses and uh, a constant sense of anxiety. You hear Slack notifications, you sleep, whatever. And <laughs> I get it, but uh, it's what you signed up for. I, I just really don't like growing up the way I did. Like I never thought I would have a job where th- this sort of thing would even be a problem to me. 
as opposed to like paying my bills. So <laughs> I, I kind of just don't have a lot of sympathy for this type of shit. I don't, I don't know. It irritates me. Uh, it feels like uh, sort of snobbish upper middle class complaining. And I don't, I don't like that, which, <laughs> you know. This is like that Tyler, the creator tweet about cyberbullying that he posted in 2012. Just, just like shut the laptop. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. It is, it's hard. I can see. But then again, I mean, honestly, when people don't respond. Who's the call me now, Solana? <laughs> I, I don't, I don't I do buy think, this at I all. feel like I might be the, clo- Sanjana, what do you think about this first before I say where, where I think I, I land here? Well, I think that this is, I mean, my issue with this bill really is that I think it's not going to change anything in practice and it's just going to add a lot of ridiculous red tape. I mean, there's a clause in it that um, if you have a, if you're going to have a job that might require round the clock work at times or work, you know, at odd hours, you have to specify it in someone's contract. Um, And so, you know, for a startup, I would assume every startup is going to have a clause in the contract that says, you know, you're, you might be required to work around the clock if, you know, we have a, a big product launch coming up or something like that, um, which is like, OK, so <laughs> what is this bill going to do in practice? I mean, you're going to have to, like, add some clauses to a contract. Uh, some employee might get mad and sue you. So I guess there's legal fees with that. Um, and maybe, you know, you'll have to pay out some money from the Department of, you know, the Department of Labor might advocate on their behalf or something and a company might have to pay out some money in settlements if they don't add that clause to the contract. But in practice, it just seems like totally, I mean, California already has all this insane, like it's, it's a miracle that the tech industry emerged here because the state has so many insane like requirements on running a company and, um, you know, all of this red tape. And this is just more of the same thing. I mean, I am actually sympathetic to people who want to disconnect at 5 p.m., but I think that this bill is not going to really do anything meaningful to that. Uh, and again, I feel like my instinct with these things is like you opt in to the jobs. And if you have a problem with the company culture in an ideal world, I guess, you know, you could maybe try to change it um, or sort of, yeah. Is there an exception for doctors or, or people like that? Jobs where like somebody dies if you don't show up? or Because I mean, that seems like crazy to me where if I'm like in the hospital and like there's only one doctor in the area that knows that can like do my heart surgery or whatever. And he's like, sorry, off the clock. I bet it, it just <laughs> you works know, like, that seems crazy like to me. all these bills work where it's sort of ambiguous and then they just punish you if they don't like you. Um, and it's, it's like, you kind of don't know until you know, I, I do think the broader, when we're, I mean, this is similar to the app thing in a way, but I think this one is more interesting, um, or more compelling. If we're living in a world where everybody has opted into the system or enough people have opted in that you sort of have to opt in to, to compete. And we can, we can just divorce this right now from the work issue. We could just talk about the expectation that I have from my friends that I respond to texts um, fairly quickly is very new. And, or, or my, certainly my, my family, my mom, like uh, my, like my partner, it's, that's, that is a strange behavior that never existed before that went from, I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you could kind of let a a text sit, but the, at this point, you really can't. Um, you're expected to sort of respond, and uh, that has that has kind of default opted all of society into a level of connectivity that many people are probably not. Com- most people, I bet, are probably not comfortable with. I think most people probably would like to be more unplugged, but it's it's very hard to do that socially now because so many people are on. No. Yeah, just turn the phone off, dude. <laughs> yeah, but there are consequences for that that never existed before. Is what I, I'm I, yeah, I think that's a good point. I just, for, for me, like I can't get over, I just don't, I don't buy, I have a hard time buying the necessity of this particular bill. Um, first off, I like all the normies that I know that work email jobs, none of them work hard at all. They all take <laughs> super long lunches. They wake up at 8.59 a.m. because they're all working from home still. Um, and they take off as soon as they can, like at four, like at four fifty nine p.m. They're off. 
I don't, I totally don't buy this notion that there are a bunch of um, exploited upper middle class workers that are getting nightmares from their Slack messages who can't just shut off the phone and uh, who can't, who have like opted into jobs that would even do that to them. I don't, I don't see it. Like it's, I don't think it's realistic. To, <laughs> it's all the, non, it's like this, you have to imagine it's the San Francisco nonprofit industrial complex type person and the government worker who are working nine to fives, who are complaining the most about this. And the ironic thing is, I don't want this bill to pass, but probably if all of those people were doing less work, it would be better. I mean, the government's yeah. not doing work at all at this point, but on the nonprofit side, like we, it would be a social benefit if they just fucking stopped for a little while. Um, last thoughts on this before we move on to the war on algebra. Yeah, I think it feeds into the ambient anxiety of the upper middle class that Barbara Aaron Wright described pretty well in uh, Fear of Falling, which is uh, a book that was written really before the internet took off. But it was um, this book that basically says that like there, there's a sort of ambient anxiety that pervades like the professional classes because your job is your identity and there is you kind of have to always be on even if you don't work that hard you have to be prepared to work at any time and like the f if you don't if you aren't able to do that then you are going to fall and you're it's, it's difficult to you you've lost your identity and you have to become like a regular sort of like shift worker and uh you lose not only your job and your income but you also kind of lose your identity in a way and i think that like that that's sort of like a little bit of what this is about it's not that people don't necessarily are, are like afraid of like responding to an email or at 6 p.m or whatever they don't want to have to like think about the email they want to be treated like um, a, a waiter or whatever. To be honest, the happiest I've ever been in my life was when I was like a waiter and yeah. I was broke because I would go in, I would clock in and then I got off and I got drunk all the time. I was also in my 20s. So like it didn't matter. But like, I mean, that was kind of, you know, you are very relaxed. You don't think about work when you're not at work. And that's what people want. But they also want the income and the prestige and the identity of being like, well, you know, I'm a coder or I'm a writer or I'm, you know, whatever. And you can't have it all. There's trade-offs to everything and you just have to accept that. And if you can't, then, you know, choose a, a slower pace, choose a different, you know, lifestyle, but just accept that there's going to be less money that comes along with it. Yeah. That's just I think life. it's an interesting distinction. I, I was also, I was a barista and I loved it. It was the best job I ever had. Um, it well, not not the best job I ever had, but it was that probably the happiest, the, like the most peaceful that I ever was. Uh, and that's just not how art works. And that's not how building companies works. And that's not how really demanding jobs where you feel like a, you've accomplished something tremendous work, work comes where it comes and you work as hard as you have to do to get something done. Um, and yeah, that's that. Sorry, Matt Haney. I know you've never had a real job in your life, but this is not how working works. There's a, there's an obvious way to sort of raise your self-confidence and be proud of yourself is to do work that you're proud of. And to do work that you're proud of, it's not usually easy. And I think, like you said, River, the laptop class here in California is trying to have its cake and eat it too. And they're not going to get there by limiting their work hours, mm -hmm. even though they already don't work hard. <laughs> yeah, I'm imagining like those. <laughs> they, they do not work hard. These they, There's nobody that's, that all, there's so many companies you can go to where they're giving you mental health days, they're giving you half day Fridays. Um, HR is just buzzing around asking if you're all right. There's perks, you know, like this still exists. Nobody in California in the laptop class is just like who who does who is, has not like nobody's being forced to work more than they want to, except for those people who are opting in and actually doing, you know, like things that they care about. Um, I do want to move on, S Sanjana. You've probably been watching this kind of, uh, I guess, yet another dust up over the question of whether or not we should be teaching our kids math uh, on Twitter, centering on Gary Tan and a company he invested in and this one deranged activist, I believe activist, uh, I don't know, 
pers- media She's personality. A- I don't know what she is. <laughs> Just t- tell me the story and let's talk about math. Yeah, speaking of uh, members of the laptop class in California with nebulous uh, job descriptions. I mean, so basically, you know, last week we talked about Joe Bowler and this kind of push to water down math education across California, um, which is happening in public schools all over the country. One of the solutions that enterprising people have sort of thought of uh, to fight back against this, like, idiotification of math uh, education is creating their own companies that teach kids uh, math at an accelerated pace. And so one of these companies is called Mentava. Uh, Gary Tan happens to be invested in it. Um, I don't know if he maybe through YC, I'm not sure, but the company seems pretty cool. It's like an app that has all of these sort of courses and you can put very young children, uh, on it and they will learn up to college level courses uh, before they're in seventh grade. So they teach reading. Um, It looks like per their sort of curriculum, they're trying to teach uh, four-year-olds kindergarten and first grade math, which is pretty cool. Apparently they're trying to teach seventh graders AP calculus and uh, fifth graders AP computer science, algebra one and two in fourth grade. Um, And they have a sort of you know, interesting pedagogical approach where they're doing flipped classrooms where kids sort of self-study the material and then they can work with a tutor, I think, who will sort of help them uh, reinforce the concepts. Uh, And they have a ton of interest, even though I'm not even sure they've launched officially yet. Um, So anyway, that brings us to Emily Mills, (laughs) who I'm not actually sure what she does. She's always on Twitter. I mean, everyone who's like familiar with SF... Twitter politics knows who SF Mills, which is her username is. She's also really obsessed with you, Solana. She uh, like has this long tweet thread where she's like, Mike Solana of Pirate Wires and Founders Fund. Uh, <laughs> really? You know, I was didn't also see this. Involved, oh, that's yeah, you should you should look into it. Uh, is like also involved. She was involved in the school board recall. Hell yeah. She brings up the one DEI of my, she, industrial. This is, a fa- this is this is fan behavior. Hi, Emily. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your support. <laughs> <laughs> she is. It was actually like really good promo for us. Um, yeah, she, you know, like mentions your interview with Chris Rufo. She's she's a fan. Wow. She watches closer than... She looked than, into... Well, not as close as my mom, but she's one of my biggest fans, it sounds like. Yeah, she read the about page on Pyrewires. Anyway, so Emily Mills <laughs> tweets out like screenshots of the slide deck from Mentava, which are saying, you know, we're going to teach two-year-olds to read at a second grade level and all this kind of cool stuff. Um, and she's like why do these folks want kids learning math so fast? Uh, And then she (laughs) screenshots something uh, where I don't know, someone, someone associated with the company is like, you know, we want to accelerate human achievement. And they're talking about how many lives would be lost if the MRNA vaccine came a year later. So this is kind of this idea that, you know, we should be educating kids well and as early as possible so that we can, you know, innovate more effectively uh, in the short and long term. And, she then says, like, she sort of reframes her critique as, like, this is an attempt to exploit children's labor because basically the idea is, like, these tech bros want to teach kids advanced math and coding so that they can build products for them and become this, like, you know, underclass of cheap labor. Um like, but, but can we just paint a picture of what that is? <laughs> That's like, I'm imagining just like thousands of like little 10 year olds in lab coats at a chalkboard just doing addition and shit. <laughs> like, that's crazy. That's a awesome in a way, but very a weird. It's like a very bizarre niche, dark fantasy. But that's yeah. not even what she's saying. She's saying they want the tech bros are coming after your future labor. I don't think that she's saying that that the tech bros are going to exploit 10 year olds no she it's does just- say she says um <laughs> she she cites a video of a kid of a, not a kid of a guy um who works for replit i guess which is invest in, in uh, yeah mentava and she said these investors literally want the kids labor um and she then doubles down in, in comments and talks and about that how, guy like, so is- then he he responds and he's like 
because she goes off on Balaji as well. And she goes after him for yeah. saying he's going to create, we're, we're going to do, we're going to take over, create new institutions, blah, blah. And she's like, this is scandalous. They're going to take over. They're going to do new things and, and create a new world. And Amjad is like, yes, we are doing that. Did you think that, did you really think you could just capture the schools, brainwash our kids, ban math, and we wouldn't do something about it? Like, we're just going to give you our children? No. Um, yeah, so it was a fun, it was a fun crazy war she had a lot of support it seemed like i mean she it wasn't like yes she's a, a crazy person but she has thousands of followers she has a lot of like she's part of that whole sort of scene of hard left uh i don't know if, uh, activists personalities whatever the people who sort of fuel the local elections at one point someone asks her what is your beef with trying to teach math and she responds and says, what is my beef with turning little toddlers into learning robots so people can use them for their future labor and bragging rights while partnering, while partnering with people who plan to utilize taxpayer funded government services until they are too big to fail and can start their own country. She also said it was only men but, who were going after her. And her implication was that like men are in some way especially obsessed with teaching math to kids. And then I guess maybe being interested in math. And I'm sitting here thinking like, who is the... Is this the feminist position that only men care about math? I don't know. Seems suspicious. River, what were you about to say? It reminds me of like old school anarchists that I used to meet sometimes when I was like more on the left where their their whole thing is like school is bad because it teaches your kid how to be a good little worker. Like it, <laughs> like it prepares them for the workforce where they can be exploited by capitalists. I'm like, well, that's going to happen anyway. So it, it's like a weird thing where they don't, the, the idea that education should have anything to do with like labor productivity, which is like what the society builds. I don't, I don't know what these people, like everybody in the fucking Soviet union was a civil engineer. Like, you know what I mean? Like they had like, like they actually were pretty invested in like making people learn practical skills to the point where it kind of actually got out of hand because they were like, you know, they figured out when you were like five, like what your occupation was going to be or whatever. Um, but it, it's like, it's really, uh, it's so, it's so strange to be like that argument that like kids like shouldn't be prepared uh, to for the workforce that you should not you shouldn't teach them practicable skills that it should just all be reading like Audrey Lord or something or but it's crazy but don't you just sort of get the sense that she doesn't really believe this i i think that the left in sf in all the cities really the, the, this has been a this is in new york this is a big deal in boston i've seen this play out um they got themselves in hot water by you know going after gifted and talented programs. Algebra specifically is under fire in California because not necessarily we don't want our kids to learn math. It started because only some kids were learning algebra at a certain age. And those kids were the gifted kids who were doing better at math. And they were sort of weighted into these things. So in an effort, I think, to do something that they perceived as the far left perceived as like equitable, uh, an equality issue, a race-based issue, um, they created this sort of strange dynamic where they were going after the edge the education people were going after teaching kids. And so the really Looney Tunes like, like Emily, then they see all this happening and rather than be like, well, wait a minute, maybe my guys are wrong about something. For example, like, I think that we should teach kids math. Actually, they have to actually find a way in their mind to justify what they think the left is actually fighting for. And in this case, it's we shouldn't teach our kids math. And so she creates this bizarre fantasy uh, where, you know, we're teaching kids math so they can participate in capitalism or something. And you can go after it in, in that dimension. But I don't I just get the sense she doesn't really believe it. I think it's all just like, you know, reptilian lizard brain reaction to the discourse. Yeah, I mean, I do think, though, in my mind, like equity, to the extent that equity means equality of outcome, these people, if you're advocating for equity in education, you're always going to be advocating for gifted kids to not perform in gifted ways because you then won't have equality of outcome. I mean, I know Emily Mills seems like totally disingenuous. Also, like an aside on her is she said she was leaving Twitter in like last June or something. <laughs> for mastodon or blue sky and she's like she's got an insane amount of uh of tweets still you know what is going on at mastodon these, has anyone checked in on mastodon i still don't even know what it is is, is it the same blue? as blue sky yeah blue sky I'll, I'll, I'll see screenshots of every now and then but mastodon i haven't heard of in ages 
I think the blue, at least blue sky was where they, um, they uncovered the, uh, the Linux backdoor hack that we had to take on a few days ago. So something's happening there. All right, go off. Presumably. None of those will ever work because it's only libs going there. Like Twitter is the hate site. Like you have to have your foil. You know what I mean? Like you have to have like somebody to fight with. Otherwise it doesn't work. Like that's why people go on Twitter is to fight with other people. Yeah, it's... You cannot... There's never going to be a nice Twitter... There's never going to be like a libs only Twitter or conservatives only Twitter. That's I mean, the reason that blue sky doesn't work is the same reason that what is Trump's thing? Uh, Truth social. Truth social. <laughs> yeah, this is the same thing. I only see screenshots of that if Trump is posting. And that's only because he's on there because he's like contractually obligated or whatever. He wants to come back to Twitter. You can tell. <laughs> I think I what is I mean, I want to believe that's true because I do enjoy his tweets and sort of the way they affect the world around them, sort of like it's like in the matrix, like you're the one and you just bend reality. He's like that with short form content. Um, but I, I get the sense that he has a weird rivalry with Elon Musk and they're, I think Trump's really suspicious of Elon sort of naturally. He, he like looks to men like that and doesn't see if you, if you can't, if you can't be in charge of something or someone I think it's threatening to him. I don't know. Has he said anything though? Because he can't keep his mouth. He did. Shut. He's he's gone after Elon before, and Elon's been extending olive branches because Elon has a business to run, and he's like, "This man, this man is going to bring in the money. We need Trump back on the platform." Um, so he's been doing nothing but extending overtures, and Trump's not been biting. Um, <laughs> I think he's. It'll see how. I think we'll see how. It, it'll depend how hard this election is, and if 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 he's fifty fifty, I think he. I think there's no keeping him off of Twitter. But if he's winning overwhelmingly, I don't know. Um, River, um, you have a crazy fucking story that you need to tell us about. Uh, take us to the squatter. Okay. Take us to the, the heart of darkness. Um, again, back to San Francisco. Sorry, it's a heavy SF uh, week. But um, we got to talk about squatters. Well, I'll get to San Francisco. Let me set it up. Uh, <laughs> so there has been squatting is the hot new craze taking over cities and various properties in various cities uh everybody's doing it mostly venezuelans <laughs> but everybody's doing it um <laughs> it, it, by the way i pull this up marlinsky venezuelan migrants who got released from an ice processing center in texas went to the bronx and took over a house and pulled these people up because people are going to be like rivers being racist again these are the whitest venezuelans i've ever seen in my life <laughs> well, blonde hair the air like hitler youth yeah this is brandon says this all Take brandon it. says it's only white people who squat and ever since he told me that every time i see a picture it's like they're they're white it's like dirtbag white barista looking people Right, it's the same of various same nationalities same even in Venezuela, all over the even world. Even when they're Venezuelan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you've got these white devils taking it over um, a house in a POC neighborhood. A woman in Queens, uh, we, we talked about her a couple of weeks ago. She was arrested for changing the locks in her own house. It was like a house that she had inherited from her parents. Uh, in San Antonio, even, they hired a contractor and the contractor started squatting their house Everybody's doing it. <laughs> it. There was that Venezuelan migrant who was like, mi gente, like, like telling Venezuelans how to squat. All kinds of crazy. The squatters are taking over. DeSantis passed a law that says that if you live in Florida, you can basically get the sheriff to come to your house while you kick the squatters out. You don't have to go through the normal eviction process. Uh, a new bill in New York uh, which is less, I guess, comprehensive than the one in Florida. It was also introduced to address this problem. All this goes back to this to San Francisco and the tenants union, which has been shaping housing policy in San Francisco since the 1970s. A couple of decades ago, they formed a organization in conjunction with Food Stop Bombs, the annoying anarchist <laughs> food bank. They do so. I mean, it's nice. They're feeding people, whatever, but they're dirt bags and they're annoying. And, um, they all claim to be straight edge, but they're all on coke. I know these people. <laughs> they they formed this organization together called Homes Not Jails, which 
is basically just a squatting organization. They recruit homeless people to take over buildings. The they uh, tell you how to squat. They connect you with resources if you're squatting and somebody tries to kick you out. And they are still deeply interconnected with the San Francisco Tenants Union. Like their Homes Not Jails shares a website with the San Francisco Tenants Union. And that that website contains a link of vacant buildings, vacant, which means just being nobody's there. I mean, this is the really crazy that you part. can squat. The fact that they have a list of properties to go and take is I don't I I I I feel like I'm always saying things are crazy <laughs> in this podcast. Crazy, it's fucking crazy. I think it's crazy. That's just fucking crazy. But this is crazy. That's crazy. That is, it's, cra it's crazy to me that you have an organization just openly doing this. Um, I don't even know, what is the steel man for squatting rights? Because they seem, it's something that seems so insane that there has to be, and it exists, some version of this exists in all 50 states. So like, what is the what is the thing that happened somewhere that made most people say, oh, we need to protect, you know. This, I, I looked into this actually, it goes all the way back to medieval English common law. Mm. It's not like, it, it, and basically the deal was, if you're in the middle ages in England, land is very scarce, it's an agricultural society. So if somebody goes on a crusade and dies or like disappears for whatever reason. It's there's not always a way to get a hold of them or to get a hold of like relatives or whatever. So they didn't want all this land to go unused and for people to importantly, people not to be paying property taxes to the crown. And so if you were someone who was like, I'll go into this farm and I'll work the land and I'll pay the taxes or whatever. Um, they basically said, okay, if you do that for a certain amount of time, you can keep it because this person abandoned their property or there's no one to take care of it. So it's yours now if you fork the land. it was It's a different, like, it, it was formed by the material circumstances of literally the Middle Ages. So, like, it doesn't really apply to what's going on in San Francisco today, but it's been carried out, you know, through through the centuries, through common law, and that's basically the basis for for squatting on a, you know, legally. Isn't the steel man that in cities across the U.S. there are just sort of like buildings that have been vacant for years and that will not, you know, it's like there are some buildings probably that have been vacant for 10 years, 15 years, and we should allow, if, if, if it could be a shelter for, home, for a homeless person, then they should just be allowed to, to go in and, and to, and to sleep under that roof because there's um, there's like no end in sight to the to the vacancy of this building and um, nobody's getting hurt because they're doing that I think that I think I feel like that's sort of the spirit of of squatting in America today yeah you can make that case but that a lot of times it's not what's happening they're not taking over you know vacant warehouses or whatever they're taking over people's houses the case that you Ooh, cited it, in san francisco with the people who were remodeling their house that's mm -hmm. that is messed up can you just yeah what what, what was that one tell, tell the story yeah it was a young couple expecting a baby they had just bought a house in san francisco and you know, permits in the city are crazy. So they're having to get permits to remodel the house so that they can move into it as a fixer upper. And as the remodeling is going on, squatters come in and they take over the house. And it was, you know, the article I cited, they still hadn't gotten their house back from the squatters. No, it's just a drug den. Yeah. The the squatters that came in there, everybody's doing no, like and the law or whatever. Gets you two ways. So there are a lot of vacant buildings. Um, though I think it's interesting that again, like these laws have always been around and everywhere. And as River mentioned, they go back, you know, forever. So it's, I don't think it's like, it's this very specific modern thing is maybe not why the laws exist, but it's how they're being justified today. But why are there so many vacant homes, uh, or, or places, let's say in San Francisco, um, part of this is foreign buyers and people holding investment property. But the problem is there's a, a fear of renting your place because once someone enters your house in a really liberal city, um, or let's not even say liberal, let's say a really blue city, um, you 
can't get them out if they stop paying. It takes, I, I'm not, I wish I knew the exact number, but it's, it's an, 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 an obscenely long period of time. I, I think it's got to be at least a year before of someone not paying or something like this. And that's only if they don't have kids. Uh, once they have kids, it's a whole other complicated situation, but it's, it's just hard to get people out. And it's like all of the, the sort of anti, <laughs> I'm going to say, we're going to defend landlords for a second. They got a raw deal in, in, in these big blue cities. And this is one of the things like you can straight up just sort of, you can enter a house and, and really almost not leave. And so of course, I mean, if that's what you're up against, if you know, you, you're sitting on a house, you're maybe going to sell it in a year or two years, three years, whatever. Is it worth taking on the risk that you're going to get somebody who screws you to that degree? And I think a lot of people in San Francisco think not. This is also why you keep seeing a push from the Board of Supervisors to introduce a tax on vacant homes. They think they can, well, it's it, the homes are vacant, so if we just tax it, it'll force them to let people in. But of course, that policy is not going to help because the reason the houses are vacant is because of other policies they've already passed that make it really not smart to rent in a lot of circumstances. Um, Sanjana, is this something that you've crossed at all? Yeah, well, I mean, I think <laughs> San Francisco has a sitting supervisor who's declared his district an eviction-free zone. I mean, this is Dean Preston. <laughs> He's literally said, you know, on my watch, I don't want any evictions happening. Um, and he was responsible for getting... The city has a permanent eviction moratorium on non-payment of, due to non-payment of rent during COVID. So, like, you know, if you were unable to pay... I don't exactly know what time period they used to define COVID. But if you were like, if you didn't pay your rent um, at any point throughout that, you can't, you can't be evicted. Um, I mean, I, and By I do the way, think Dean they, Preston. Oh, sorry. I was going to say Dean Preston and the San Francisco tenants union, the, the organization we're talking about, they did a, uh, they, he, they endorsed him and yeah. they've worked with him and he did a uh, workshop with them at the Tenderloin museum. <laughs> like they're very close. Yeah. Yep. And Dean started Tenants Together, which is an organization that does, you know, this kind of similar tenants rights advocacy that gets really extreme. I mean, I think like the funny thing about all of this is you look at the people who are involved in this like activism. A lot of them live in the hate. Um, They are, you know, they come from money. Um, Many of them kind of like, you know, they either have inherited properties themselves like Dean (laughs) uh, or they, you know, opt into these like co-ops where they live, you know, collectively and that kind of thing. But they have no sense of like, they, they have this totally infantilizing view also of homeless people because they're, they're like entirely disconnected from the reality of like who the homeless in San Francisco actually are. It's like the homeless in San Francisco are not people who have been priced out of homes that they were already paying for in San Francisco. These are drug tourists, many of whom are like, actively psychotic who you know you put them in the sros they have ways to get rooms here and they just destroy them uh like it's i don't know i think there's there's a lot of um levels at which the people who are advocating for squatting here are like completely disconnected from even the like poor and dispossessed people they claim to be trying to empower i think that the squatting thing does have the potential to to become a major national story, uh, especially it's an election year, it's an easy thing to talk about, and it's a hard thing to go after if you're on the left. And Biden is, um, you're gonna lose. He's already having trouble with his base on the Palestine stuff. Like y- you take away squatting, I mean, you lose the baristas forever. And I don't know that the Democrats can handle that because who is left as River? You mentioned earlier, like they've lost the working class. What is left in that party? Uh, they they really need they really need the coalition. Um, I don't know. Am I wrong? Do you do you think? Because I mean, DeSantis already making it an issue by going after it. Um, I can see this becoming something that every state sort of has to address. Also, the more that people expose that these laws exist, I think the more squatting is going to happen. I think probably we'll see a spike of this in places like New York and San Francisco because a lot of losers are just learning for the first time that you can literally just take someone's house and it's fine. Yeah, the uh, San Francisco Tenants Union website even tells you kind of how to do it. And it they basically tell people to lie and to say that whenever they try to evict you, to say that you have a verbal agreement with the landlord uh, to lease the house and that you're leasing it. And 
then you have to go through like a whole court process and blah, blah, blah. And the thing is, is that if you stay at the building long enough under like certain circumstances, you can actually like get the deed. Like you could actually literally permanently steal the house. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if they've done that with individual houses with homes, not jails, but they've definitely done it. Um, they even brag about it on their website with, um, with like vacant uh, industrial buildings where they've gotten homeless people in the buildings, got them to stay there forever, fought off evictions, and eventually just literally took over the house. It would be crazy to be sort of a Venezuelan like border hopper who hears about on TikTok, you're, you're hearing about like these strange American laws where it's like finders keepers. If you see an empty house, you can just walk in and they really, I mean, why? I don't know. Like if you're not from the country and you hear that, you're like, is that man, it is the land of milk and honey. We got to get there as fast as we can. Um, and then they get here and it's like, I don't know. I guess that's sort of true, but maybe frowned upon. <laughs> Certainly, uh, I'm frowning upon it now. I'm excited to see how the story plays out. Um, great talking about it with you guys today. Thanks for talking about it in the comments section. Tell everybody about this podcast. Rate, review, subscribe, or die. Talk to you next week.